All right. Well, welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Why is James Comey So Wrong About uh, Encryption, uh, which, which is, uh, uh, of course, James Comey ended up getting uh, fired from his position as the director of the FBI. Uh, he's still wrong. It's just not quite as important that he's wrong. Um, he's still so wrong. He's so... <laughs> Uh, so uh, I'll be. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the deputy executive director and general counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we're a nonprofit civil liberties organization based out in San Francisco, uh, and we try and fight for your uh, digital rights uh, online. Um, so I, I was going to give a brief introduction uh, of the topic, and then we'll go down, uh, and uh, everyone will introduce themselves on this fine panel. You're very lucky to have such great panelists today. Uh, and then uh, if people have questions, we can entertain questions from the audience or we can uh, just uh, talk a little bit about some of the issues it raises. Uh, so uh, one, one of the, I guess, uh, uh, important bits of, of history here, and we can go into this in just more detail, is that uh, uh, this, is, this is, we are in the middle of what you might call Crypto Wars Part 2, uh, the, the empire striking back. Uh, it is, uh, there was crypto wars of the 90s where there was a real push by, uh, by the government uh, uh, to uh, ask for backdoors into, um, into encryption. Uh, they did not want uh, for a, uh, a world in which they did not have access to, uh, to communications. Um, and uh, we, uh, just to make that, that relatively uh, short story, it didn't work. Uh, and they uh, uh, were unable to uh, uh, mandate backdoors or, or ban encryption. It came up in a number of forums. There were issues about whether you could export encryption, and there was a period of time in which software would have a domestic version and an international version, and the international version would have uh, ridiculously weak crypto, so it was easy for uh, security agencies to, uh, to break it. Uh, this was not actually a real check. Anybody who was remotely competent could figure out how to get the uh, domestic version uh, overseas, but nevertheless, that was the rule for a while. Uh, there was a proposal to have a, uh, a clipper chip, which uh, I think I will take a little, to talk a little bit more about, um, but uh, this was a chip that would uh, have a key escrow, uh, and in fact, if you, if you like this bit of history, uh, Matt has provided a, a clipper phone for the charity auction uh, here at Dragon Con, and so you can get a piece of crypto history uh, if you participate in that auction. So uh, for a while it seemed that those crypto wars had, uh, had been won, uh, but then they came back uh, in, in full force. And I would say that probably one of the big reasons for it, it coming back was that instead of encryption being a you know, relatively rare thing, uh, it became extremely commonplace. Uh, Apple uh, iMessage uh, by default was encrypting iMessage communications and so there are you know millions of people who were sending end -to encrypted uh, messages without even knowing that they were doing so. Uh, we had companies like uh, WhatsApp now part of Facebook turned on encryption and with that a billion people were getting end-to-end -end encryption uh, and this raised a lot of uh, alarms in, in government and they went back to a, uh, a familiar refrain same language they had been using in the in the 90s we're going dark uh, that you know we can't see as much as we can see. This is a bit disingenuous. This is one of the reasons why Comey is so wrong, is that it's actually the golden age of surveillance. They have so many ways of, of you know, uh, surveilling people, looking at location information, looking at metadata, uh, that it's fairly disingenuous to say that they're worse off as a, as a result of, of some of these changes. But nevertheless, uh, that, uh, that came for some, some push. And uh, where this really came into a lot of the public consciousness uh, uh, recently was when the government tried to uh, require Apple to provide access to an iPhone that was uh, uh, the company phone of one of the San Bernardino uh, attackers, uh, one of the terrorists who, who attacked uh, the county uh, uh, community center in San Bernardino. And it wasn't his personal phone, but uh, it was a uh, phone issued by the county to him, and he had left it in this uh, car, and then uh, they uh, sat around for, with it for a while, and then decided to use it as a case to establish that they can force Apple to uh, uh, give them access. Uh, and this was, this was a bit of a uh, watershed moment because uh, 
it wasn't that they were saying you know use the sort of the powers that you you already have but rather make new code write a new version of the OS put it on here and have it so it disables some of the security features um, and so it was uh, quite a quite a big ask uh, there was a case about it initially they got an order saying Apple had to do it uh, Apple uh, resisted uh, some 70 or so amicus groups in, including uh, EFF and, and access now um, which Amy is uh, is part of uh, put in amicus briefs we got ours in first and they're super speedy about it um, and then at the eve of the hearing, I mean literally the eve of the hearing, some people had already gone off by plane to go down to the hearing down in uh, uh, Southern California. Uh, I myself was on the way to the airport. Um, and then they said, oops, never mind, we found a way in. Uh, and so the case was withdrawn, the, the legal issues were not decided. Uh, because they had uh, uh, purchased a exploit that allowed them to get into the phone without Apple's assistance. But the issue remains live. There has been legislation. There have been uh, big pushes here. Currently, nothing that's really uh, has legs, but overseas, uh, around the world, there's a lot of encryption uh, legislation. So uh, it's still a very hot and very live issue. So with that sort of brief back background, let's go to our panelists. Um. <clears throat> Hey, I'm Ishan. I work uh, with the Internet Governance Project at Georgia Tech. I'm also a grad student there. And I'm also part of a group called Electronics Frontiers Georgia, which tries to deal with security, privacy issues at the local and state level. Um, so I think that's one way. I'm just going to put a plug here. If you want to be engaged at the local level, please talk to me or Scott uh, about the talking about encryption and stuff like that at the Georgia level. And talking about today's panel today, um, not only has this been a thing which you've seen in the past, it's also a thing which you're going to see in the future. Uh, just because encryption is so good today is um, and so prevalent, uh, when we talk about IoT, it's not only going to be your laptop or your phone which is encrypted, it's going to be your car and your washing machine and your refrigerator and you know who, kno who knows what else. So these are going to be more means of collecting data on you, uh, of surveilling you, and w that is why this battle is so important to ensure that as we enter this IoT age that whatever communication channels we have, whatever technology we have is secure. Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am U.S. Policy Manager at Access Now. Um, we do global human rights um, where it intersects with technology. Uh, so encryption really cuts to the heart of a lot of the work that we do, not only um, working on encryption policy, but also actively encouraging people to use it through our technology helpline um, that provides 24-7 <laughs> assistance to activists and journalists and other users at risk all over the world. Um, so we care a lot about encryption because in our line of work and in the line of work that we help people with, it actually is a matter of life or death, whether or not people um, can protect their communications. Um, so it, it is very important um, in our field. On the other side, we have launched um, a website called securetheinternet.org um, that's signed by organizations, experts, people at this table, um, all over the world trying to speak with one voice to say um, encryption is important not only for the safety benefits that it provides, um, but for the economic benefits it provides, um, as well as for the fact that we are entering a much more um, technological world, as Ashan said, and we need a lot more encryption out there. We, we shouldn't be looking at undermining it. Um, and not only that, but in the Apple case that Kurt referenced, you can't undermine it really for only one person or one, only one group of people, um, say for example foreigners, um, because that process of undermining that security um, impacts everybody in some way or another. Um, so trying to get to the communications of the quote unquote bad guys, um, whoever that group of people may be to you, um, is actually going to make it easier for people to get to all of your communications, um, including people you might not want to have access to them. Um, there's the old adage, you know, you, why do you care if you have nothing to hide, um, that I take great issue with because I think I have, I have at least never met somebody who didn't want 
to keep some information private. It's not necessarily bad information. It's not necessarily anything that you're doing wrong. It's that people shouldn't have access to all of your data and encryption in a technological world is the first line of defense that you have um, to make sure you can protect your information communications, including bank records, um, online purchasing habits, medical records, et cetera. Um, and so that's just a few of the perspectives that we bring to this. And now I'm very humbled to turn it over to Matt Blaze, who's basically a legend in this space. So, yeah, you already said everything I wanted to say. But, uh, <laughs> so I'll, 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 I'll say some new stuff. Um, so I'm uh, Matt Blaze. I'm a professor in the computer science department at the University of Pennsylvania. I've been uh, doing uh, cryptography and computer security uh, since uh, somewhere around uh, 1990. And, um, one of the things that I start with uh, on this is the sort of inescapable observation that I am in the only area of computer science that's making negative progress. Um, you know, I, I have friends who do computer graphics and computer architecture, and every year, you know, what they their situation is like a million times better than last year. And you have you know beautiful uh, advances in just about every area of computing. Um, that's happened, and we have Moore's Law that says, you know, things get every 18 months, capability doubles, and people just take great advantage of that. The one area where things are going backwards in ways that everybody will agree on is security, right? Why is that? Well, the reason is that there is one fundamental problem in computing that we know we can't solve, which is software correctness. Um, uh, you know, sort of to oversimplify it. We don't know how to build at scale software that doesn't have bugs. Bugs have been with us since the beginning of software. Things fail all the time. What that means is we don't know how to build large scale systems that are all based on software and get more complex each year that all these other computer scientists make, thing, make computers do more stuff better. That adds complexity that makes it much more likely that it's also going to have unintended uh, behavior. And uh, so we're making negative progress on com uh, in security as kind of the price we're paying for getting all this great stuff like, you know, web pages with dancing frogs on them. And, um, uh, you know, so we're, we're now to the point where we're basically in you know, I hate to use the word cyber, a cybersecurity crisis, right? I mean, you know, we're now using stuff for incredibly serious life and death, the economy, our personal privacy, um, you know, all depend on incredibly complex computing systems that get breached, you know, literally so often it's not newsworthy when it happens. Um, and what do we do about it? Well, there are two things we know work. They don't solve the problem completely, but these are the only two things that work. One is to make systems as simple and as small as possible. We don't know, we're, we are apparently unwilling to do that, right? I mean, it, 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 software systems are just getting bigger and harder. The other thing that works is encryption. Um, encryption works because what it does is basically limits the number of components of a system that um, you have to trust, that, that, that you have to say, no, this can't have a bug in it. With encryption, you don't get rid of the bugs, but you reduce the number of things where the bugs matter. Uh, and this is essentially the only technology that we have that counters uh, this uh, horrible uh, crisis uh, that we're in. And so anything we do that discourages encryption or weakens encryption or makes encryption more expensive or more difficult is essentially gonna make, take away the only tool that we have uh, to counter this uh, increasingly bad crisis. So on that cherry note. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, if people have questions, do we have the, the, the box? Uh, all right, well, while we're getting that, that started, why don't I actually, uh, we, we had teased this a little bit before, but Matt, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the clipper chip and how that uh, was uh, uh, broken? So um, the first sort of salvo uh, in Crypto War One, before we knew to number them, um, was uh, in 1992. The um, uh, federal government worried about encryption. Um, they worried because suddenly consumer products were just starting to 
to use encryption in software. And they were worried that this was going to make wiretaps obsolete. I worked at Bell Labs at the time, part of AT&T and the Bell system, and AT&T produced a product called the TSD3600, because AT&T has amazingly imaginative names for things, um, which is basically an encrypted telephone. And it used DES encryption, which was sort of the state of the art um, at the time. And the government learned about this and completely freaked out. And they said, hey, AT&T, you got to take this phone off the market. These criminals are going to buy it, and it's going to make wiretaps obsolete. And AT&T said, OK. <laughs> but the deal was that they would replace the data encryption standard chip, which everybody kind of trusted at the time, with a new NSA design, National Security Agency designed, uh, algorithm embedded in a chip called the Clipper chip. And the Clipper chip would have stronger encryption than the data encryption standard provided, but with a catch, which is that it would essentially include an encrypted copy of the session key that's used to encrypt your conversation uh, when it sets up the call, encrypted with a key that would be held in escrow by the government. And um, you know the um, so you know you'd get slightly stronger encryption. But it could be wiretapped if, because this copy of the key would be stored in escrow. This was, it turns out, a controversial idea. Um, and pretty much everybody in the in, in encryption community was horrified by this because, first of all, it added complexity to the system. Secondly, you have to trust, even if you trust the government, to only want to take these keys out of escrow if there's a legitimate crime. You also have to trust them to build a system where nobody is going to be able to get unauthorized access to the keys. And we don't know how to build systems like that, um, particularly if there, you know, there, there are you know, literally you know, hundreds of wiretaps a day. So this database is going to be you know, used all the time. Um, so um, the, uh, they released this revised version of the TSD, the TSD3600E for escrow. Um, and um, you know, I don't think anybody bought it except the federal government, uh, which bought a warehouse full of them. Um, that was kind of the quid pro quo for including the chip. Um, I have one of those. I donated it to the charity auction. You should bid high on it, except I think the auction might have already happened. Um, but uh, um, the, uh, I discovered some flaws that would let you bypass the escrow feature and use it in ways that the government wouldn't be able to wiretap. And that kind of killed the whole idea because it made, made it expensive and bad. And you know, we spent kind of the 1990s arguing about whether encryption should be available. And then in 2000, um, the government basically kind of gave up and said, you know what, encryption is important. And we declared victory for a while. And amazingly, after September 11th, um, the government really didn't make any strong attempt immediately after September 11th to, to, to stop encryption, even though the political environment was one where they probably could have. Because I think there was a recognition that this is an important national security issue, being able to secure all of these communications matters. Um, and then we went crazy again, and here we are. All right, so we got the, uh, the, the box ready for questions. Uh, and please, uh, uh, li like on, on Jeopardy, phrase it in the form of a question, uh, and try and keep it uh, you know, to, uh, relatively short as the questions go. All right. Um, Where's the um, so in my opinion, the uh. encryption on the software side is kind of the easy part. Software is cheap. What I worry about the most is my endpoint being secure and hardware specifically. Um, there's not a lot of open source hardware out there. Um, so I have an encryption company and I'm trying to do all my stuff securely and I'm in the process of trying to figure out what kind of laptop I should be doing that on. Um, what's your opinion on secure hardware? All right, um, well, I think end endpoint security is a very, very important thing. Uh, because if you have end-to-end -end encryption uh, that is unbreakable, then the, the, the main option that the, uh, the government uh, has, has left is to, or any attacker for that matter, uh, is to surveil the, uh, the endpoint. Um, I don't have a particular recommendation about like what endpoints to use uh, that, that are more highly secure. Um, 
But uh, uh, Amy, did you want to talk a little bit about network intrusion tools and some of the the effects uh, that uh, strong crypto has on uh, attacks on endpoints? Sure. I wish I, I wish I had a recommendation for you, but I will tell you that the the FBI has moved a lot into this question of of device or endpoint security, um, as well as endpoint backdoors. Um, and I think their focus from a policy and legal perspective is increasingly on that perspective as well. Um, on the other side, I think, is the issue that Kurt is bringing up, which is um, the ever-growing use by the U.S. and other governments of hacking as an investigative tool. Mm -hmm. um, and to tease the panel tomorrow that is called Crypto Wars Update U.S., Europe, and Beyond, um, I will talk about this a little bit more, but essentially the FBI in the United States um, has interpreted its its normal authorities to allow it to install what they deem to be what they call um, network investigative techniques and is essentially malware except the FBI thinks that when it installs malware it's not malware that somehow they get to wave their magical not malware wand mm -hmm. um, and make it not malware they're allowed to with a normal court order or warrant um, whatever process they decide to go through um, install that on um, on specific computers. Um, and the reason I don't say on target computers or on suspect computers is because now the most infamous case where this was used was where the FBI basically seized and took over a um, server that was um, serving child pornography and operated a child pornography website for a period of time. Um, actually, and I believe made it more efficient and effective and quicker at delivering the child pornography. <laughs> Yeah, that was awkward. Um, and in the process, everybody who visited that website had malware installed on their computer so that they could track them. Um, people took issue with this not because they thought child pornography was a good thing or that people who visited child pornography websites um, should be in jail, because I think that was relatively accepted in the community, but because hacking into computers has a lot of consequences that were not considered when um, surveillance laws were written. And the last time the government decided that they had a new investigative technique that was more intrusive than former investigative techniques, they passed a new law. Um, and that's where we got the Wiretapping Act, and that's why wiretapping has um, special um, steps and special um, standards that have to be met beyond normal searches. Um, and so because there is not a law on government hacking that recommends it, a lot of people took issue with this, um, the government has used this in other circumstances, including um, a case involving Tor Mail um, that I think showcases a lot of the problems better than the child pornography case because just visiting a child pornography website is a crime. Visiting a website um, where people can send and receive messages is not a crime. And whilst people could be using that for shady things, um, a lot of people used it for very legitimate non-shady interactions and they were also having malware installed on their on their devices um, so it's being used very broadly we don't have a lot of information about it and I think that endpoint compromise is going to be one of the ways that the FBI ends up solving the crypto wars without massively undermining um, encryption but it will I think have broad impacts on security um, because we can't control malware essentially and there will be problems so let me just add a little to that. Um, that you know, I mean, first of all, the title of this panel is "Why is James Comey so wrong?" Um, and you know, the, one of the reasons is that it was kind of his job to be wrong about this. Um, you know, every FBI director has kind of had the same position on this, which is that the job, which is their job, which is to advocate for things that make the FBI's job as easy as possible. And you know, if I were the head of the FBI. I would want one-stop shopping for wiretaps in the infrastructure. You know, there's absolutely no question that that is more, much more convenient and cheap and cost-effective and and, um, and and so on than having to go to the endpoint or collect evidence in other ways. The thing, the problem is, the FBI's job isn't crime prevention; it's crime solving, right? You know, the um, and you know, society as a whole has other equities, as tech people, uh, as policy people like to say. Uh, you know, we want to reduce the overall rate of crime. We don't just want to solve crimes. But the FBI's job is to investigate existing things. So the question is not 
what makes the FBI's job as easy as possible, because that's what they're going to advocate for. But the question is, what can we do that lets the FBI do its job um, that um, also doesn't endanger us in other ways that go kind of outside the FBI's charter? And you know, given our cybersecurity crisis, having you know restrictions on encryption or or requirements for backdoors in endpoints, you know will make the FBI's job easier, but it's going to result in an overall increase in crime and privacy violations and all sorts of things that you know we as a society have to avoid. So I think what we're going to see is the ultimate compromise is that the FBI is going to become uh, you know, much more capable of exploiting kind of existing vulnerabilities that endpoints have um, because we don't know how to build endpoints that don't have them. And they're going to use them for targeted attacks against, um, um, you know, uh, against their investigative subjects. Now the problem is we don't have laws that really cover this very well, and that you know a lot of the, there's uncertainty about what the legal limitations to this are, and we are really going to have to address that uh, going forward. I'm really looking forward to Matt Blaze's upcoming graphic novel series, A Cybersecurity Crisis on Infinite Earths. <laughs> That would be awesome. All right, do we have uh, another uh, audience uh, question? Uh, hi there. Uh, I guess to uh, broach briefly on your question, I think she'd asked about hardware. Um, I think the only thing, and not to speak on any form of expertise because I'm not an expert at working computer science. Um, if you want to buy hardware, you want to start with a laptop or device that has a trusted platform module because it can store and generate secure keys on the device and your software can utilize that device to do so. So you want to start with investing in a machine that has that. It's a bit costly, but it'll be worth it. Uh, a trusted platform module, uh, they come installed in service frequently, but you can find them in more expensive laptops for security purposes. Sorry to um, reach on that. My question was, um, you guys brought up end-to-end uh, -end point uh, encryption with messaging such as iMessage. Uh, WhatsApp and such, and I wanted to pivot back to that because, you know, as you see the general populace taking up iMessage, I find that there are a lot of dangerous divisions in that um, because if you're not using WhatsApp and let's say you're using just your average everyday Android device, how are we? How is the industry and how are we, as researchers, uh, promoting the security of mobile-to-mobile -mobile communications such as like S just general SMS messages and standard, uh, you know phone calls that go through this general cellular networks. How are we going to secure those? Because I find that we're going to end up with a class of people who are still using standard SMS messages on Android phones and such that we're going to be classing out of encryption. And uh, it's just mm -hmm. a general concern of mine. Yep. I mean, I think we're actually transitioning away from that slowly. Um, I think we have, I mean, we have a very insecure phone system um, that Matt can <coughs> probably speak on in much greater detail and much more interestingly than I can. Um, that's a real problem. I think the growth of WhatsApp and Signal and iMessage actually shows that there is a market for secure messaging and phone calls um, that people will gravitate toward um, and people will adopt, especially when you make it easy. And I think one of the things encryption communications tools have lacked up until that point was ease of use mm -hmm. and usability. Um, and when you start implementing them in ways that people don't need to input a private key and a public key and why the hell do you have two, sorry, why do you have two keys and what do these two keys do and I don't understand and oh my god I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, instead we have these very easy platform tools with good options. Um, I think that's going to transition a lot more people. Um, availability of the tools is going to be a thing and frequency of use and um, variety of use. Um, I would love to get to a point where I don't have to have six different messaging applications mm -hmm. installed on Only my phone <laughs> that <laughs> I communicate with people on. Um, but I'm glad that I have those six and that many of them are very secure and mm -hmm. people are using them. Yeah. So yeah. I, can I just add one thing to that, which is that you know you pointed, you, you hinted at a real legit problem, which is a kind of security digital divide, right? Which, you know, so the, I have an iPhone running kind of latest software and I'm tech savvy and I have all sorts of apps that, that can do stuff. Too many of them, but, you know, at least I have them. Um, if you're running, uh, but, you know, in order to take advantage of that, I need a relatively expensive smartphone with a data plan. And, um, you know, the, the cheap burner phone that you buy at the 7-Eleven, uh, that a huge fraction of Americans, particularly Americans who sometimes are the targets of criminal investigations, 
Um, you know, they're stuck using SMS and voice telephone calls for, on those phones. And those, are, those services are largely incompatible with the kind of uh, uh, secure end-to-end -end encrypted apps. And that is a, a, an issue that we, we're going to have to confront. Yeah. yeah, and just to add to that, I think as what Amy said is very true, as technology becomes more easy to use and becomes more prevalent. So uh, my grandmother's in India and she uses WhatsApp calling to call me and that is the only person I talk to uh, with 100% encryption. And you know, <laughs> it's not something I want to hide from anybody, but I'm really happy about that, that my grandmother, who is 75 plus, uh, is fully secure in her communications. And uh, so I think that is where we eventually uh, want to see society to lead to that, you know, with VoIP and with WhatsApp and Signal and stuff like that, that, you know, if you can already use audio calls on Signal and WhatsApp to secure your phone calls. So I think eventually as we move more towards these applications, uh, you'll see that concern go down. And I want you all to remember this the next time you use your mother or grandmother as the technological <laughs> dunce in your life. I know you all do it. I'm watching you. They know more than you do, I'm guessing. Uh, I just want to tie, tie a, a couple of threads together there was that uh, one of the things I think that's been very successful about rolling out encryption and, and helping with this divide is that WhatsApp is often being used not because people care about encryption, but because it is a free way of making calls, or at mm -hmm. least their cheapest option for making calls, yeah. especially if they need to make international calls. Uh, and so uh, you don't have to convince people that you know encryption is necessary or they have something to hide or anything like that. You're just like, hey, free calls. You want to call me from India? Here's this thing, and it's free. Uh, I mean, so you have to have a data plan and Wi-Fi and so on, so it's not free-free. Uh, but the the other side, which you, you were alluding to, was by talking about the the Android phones. Uh, this is a, is a big problem. We, were, you know, Matt was just talking about you know, the burner you buy at 7-Eleven. This problem is is even more so uh, throughout the rest of the world, where uh, a lot of the phones that you can buy are going to be uh, several generations uh, back uh, phones. They that are maybe you know out of encrypt, uh, security updates or maybe in the last year that they'll get security updates uh, and that it's quite possible that someone buying a, a new to them phone, uh, they'll put WhatsApp on it, but the phone itself has several remote uh, exploits that are, are known and haven't been patched and their endpoint uh, is is terribly insecure. All right, shall we have another question? I'm oh, sorry, yeah. Hi. So this entire Apple versus FBI saga happened under what I would consider a relatively uh, civil rights friendly uh, administration. So what we, and, and that came fairly dangerously close to setting a dangerous precedent and allowing the breaking of encryption. And what we've seen globally is that there are a large number of governments and politicians who are willing to kind of stick their head in the sand and say, I don't care what's possible, what's dangerous, we're going to mandate this. I mean, I, something to the effect of, I respect the laws of mathematics, but what matters here is the laws of Math doesn't work in Australia, it yeah. turns out. <laughs> yes, which as a mathematician really hurt me. But uh, what do you see as kind of the end state of this? It, do we have to fight this battle every five years when the pendulum swings? Is there ever, and what happens if it swings so far that eventually we do get one of these terrible laws passed that mandates back doors? Is there a constitutional argument against repealing, or for repealing one of these laws? And what do you see as um, of that? Well, one thing uh, is that uh, uh, in the Apple case, we did bring up some, some constitutional uh, arguments. Um, that uh, the, the arguments that uh, uh, EFF raised were uh, First Amendment uh, arguments. This is uh, uh, so not saying that the Fourth Amendment prevents this search so much as that the First Amendment is uh, pro protects your right to free speech. Code is speech, and that was established in, in Crypto Wars Round One, uh, and therefore uh, the government could not mandate that uh, coders were you know, unable to do uh, strong end, end encryption because that would be uh, regulating their speech based on the content. So if, if such a law were to pass in the US, uh, there, would be, there would be several challenges, but that would at least be, be one of them. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are um, lots of other countries who have already passed some laws, um, which I guess that's, that's a topic for our panel tomorrow, so we should probably hold off on that for, for now. I will all right, say. come back tomorrow to learn all about 
uh, the crypto wars in the future and around the world. I use this analogy in DC and it doesn't get a lot of play, but I bet it'll get play in this audience. Um, has anybody read The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin? Okay, read the book, first of all. Bad nerds. Um, I actually compare the crypto wars to that book, because in the book it's like everything is normal and you have summer, spring, winter, fall, but every now and then the whole freaking world goes boom and you get what they call a fifth season and it's basically times when mass people die and everything's in turmoil and everything's a mess. And that's kind of the way encryption is, where it's always the threat of having a crypto war is there and you have to worry about it and you have to worry about it, but you can pretty much go about your life and then something happens, like Edward Snowden reveals a document that shows the NSA might have tampered with encryption standards and boom, and everything is a mess for a little while. Um, I don't know if we can stop that from occurring. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get rid of these fifth crypto seasons, um, unfortunately, and I think this might be something, because there's a, no way to win. Um, they can keep pushing for a law until they get it. It's hard to push for the anti-crypto law. Yeah, it, it, you know, let me just point out what worked in Crypto War One was, you know, there was there was some great work being done by the legal community, the civil liberties community, but we didn't actually really win until industry got on board and kind of said, look, this is really important to the, you know, upcoming, you know, dot com era that we have uh, availability of encryption. Please just stop. And, you know, it, I, I think that was, you know, I, we can all pat ourselves on the back, um, but, you know, I, it, it was once we got industry really behind this and the tech industry really started its it, having a voice in D.C., that was really helpful. Yeah. And just going back to the pendulum com uh, comment, I think, um, y yes, every five years we are going to have this battle, and I think not only is it probably going to be a U.S.-centric battle, I don't want to tread on the next panel, on the panel tomorrow, sorry, but um, I think it's going to be a battle everywhere because, you know, if uh, another country decides that we don't need encryption and they build a backdoor, that means there's a backdoor everywhere. So, and, you know, a more popular analogy might be that the encryption winter is always coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, another, another question, please. Yeah. This question is for Kurt. Um, I'm an attorney as well, and I was just wondering, how is it that you found yourself in this particular field? Um, does your background, your undergrad background, involve technology, or how did you find yourself falling into this area? Uh, well, so my undergrad uh, background was liberal arts, uh, but I was always uh, into computers. You know, I had a, a computer since I was a, uh, a small child. Uh, uh, my first computer was a Commodore PET. I don't know if anyone remembers that. All right, thank you. Uh, and so just enjoyed uh, uh, playing with computers. And uh, then after uh, uh, becoming a lawyer, uh, started to do uh, some pro bono work uh, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And then uh, uh, there was a job opening there and, and switched over and, and have been uh, uh, enjoying working there uh, ever since. Another uh, next. Uh, hey there, sorry oh. guys. Um, Ishana, I just wanted to tell you uh, briefly to decide not to feel ashamed about your grandmother. My significant other only uses WhatsApp to get calls from his grandmother in Lebanon. So um, uh, I wanted to pivot back to mobile security again. Uh, Matt, I'd like to direct this question at you um, since Amy pointed out your skill set. Uh, so I guess moving away from the less secure infrastructure that we currently have to uh, IP based communications in the mobile industry, how do you see? industry responding to this change, are they actively responding to this or are they moving over for efficiency purposes? Uh, are we actually gaining more security out of VOLTE and other technologies? Um, um, mostly no, uh, and part of the reason is that the phone system is uh, uh, heavily regulated and you know, uh, the, one of the very few sort of anti-crypto laws that have actually passed on the book is a law called the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act that essentially requires that there be a backdoor in phone switches, including cellular mobile telephone switches, that allow, um, <coughs> that allow uh, wiretaps to be executed. And any encryption provided by the network itself, this has to be able to bypass that and provide the clear text 
of communication that goes through it. End-to-end -end encryption, they don't have to uh, provide the keys, but encryption that the network itself provides, they have to be able to. And that's, you know, an existing law, phone switches all comply with that. Um, and so, uh, you know, and it also applies to things like the ability to deliver text messages in real time and metadata in real time. Um, uh, you know, and the question of whether that covers things like location services, those are kind of open legal questions. But so I, you know, I would say that while the mobile infrastructure is becoming more robust over time because we're relying on it more, what it isn't, uh, it also has legally mandated built-in backdoors. And that, from a security point of view, is very concerning because we've actually seen these exploited by bad guys. You know, it's not just not just law enforcement that's able to use these with a warrant. We've, occasion, we've seen cases um, where um, uh, foreign intelligence services and, and parties unknown have been able to uh, find ways to get in and exploit these back doors. Um, I, want, I wanted to ask you, go back to the Comey Apple situation. So I followed it pretty closely, the San Bernardino, Bernardino phone was his work phone and Apple got into this big battle and then all of a sudden uh, Comey said they got some sort of, that it was dropped. I wondered if you have any real, any inside knowledge of whether they just dropped it or did they get some sort of a tool to break into it? They did. I heard it was an Israeli company yeah. that um, provided it. Does that mean that all of our iPhones are at risk now? Um, so we know a couple of things. Um, so yes, yeah, so right, right before uh, the the hearing, uh, they got an exploit, um, and they they purchased the exploit. Uh, and just for a bit of terminology, I'm going to differentiate between vulnerabilities and exploits. So the vulnerability, if you if you know about the vulnerability, you can make the exploit. Uh, if you know about the exploit, you may be able to figure out what the vulnerability was uh, on it, but uh, they got uh, what was known as a black box exploit, so that they weren't supposed to look and figure out what the vulnerability was and just be able to use the particular exploit. And as I understand it, the particular exploit works on the 5C uh, model and maybe some earlier models, but not on the 6 or later uh, models. So I think it is it is a good bet that if you have a 5C or earlier, uh, that you definitely, well, you should always do this, but keep your security up to date and hope that Apple figured out what that vulnerability was, but it was not, uh, it was not told to them what the vulnerability was. Yeah, yeah. The 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 model number uh, in the Apple Apple world and has been incremented since. And the it's possible that Apple fixed the vulnerability in the operating system, but the um, uh, the government didn't tell Apple what the vulnerability was. In fact, claimed because they bought a black box exploit, they didn't know what the vulnerability was, uh, and therefore they didn't have to go through the vulnerabilities equities process, which the government has said, you know, that's what we do, we find a vulnerability, we go through this equities process to see whether uh, on balance it makes people more secure to disclose it, or whether it's more important to use it for investigative purposes. Uh, but it turns out if you just buy the exploit and, and not the vulnerability, uh, then there's no need to go through that process, and so uh, they didn't, and didn't tell Apple. But it is possible that Apple, uh, <coughs> through independent research, through sort of uh, knowing that this exploit uh, existed, was able to discover it and, and fix it for the 5C. But also, there are hardware differences in the later models that would make it unlikely that uh, uh, a similar exploit would work past the 5C. Is that, I mean, I don't know. And let me just reiterate what Matt said earlier, is that the bugs will, the vulnerabilities, the bugs will always exist. Um, we can't build, I don't think, perfect hardware or perfect software. Um, there will probably always be something that somebody can take advantage of in your phone. Um, and that's why it's so important that the security teams at these companies are able to develop encryption freely and as strongly as they can. Because once they start having to develop I think I'm stealing actually Matt's words from another panel here, but encryption that fails only sometimes, um, there, there are going to be even more problems that we have to contend with. Yeah. Um, one other thing I just want, wanted to add is there's, there's an interesting way of at least uh, uh, approximating how difficult it is to, to get into an endpoint. 
uh, which is what is what is the price for a vulnerability? And so, uh, as, I, as I understand it, uh, the, the price for a uh, uh, modern uh, iOS vulnerability is somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars. Um, a price there was recently someone was advertising that they'd pay five hundred thousand for exploits to WhatsApp and Signal, uh, and then you know uh, a, a exploit to like a older version of Android might not get you much money at all. Uh, and so you can sort of look at some of the, the, these prices and, and have some idea of how hard it is to, to find these vulnerabilities and create an exploit for them, but also that there is a market and if someone's got the money, they can, they can buy exploits. Yeah, and um, you know, just because this particular exploit was for the 5C or uh, earlier model doesn't mean that this is, an, this is a battle which is over because I think the ACLU mapped uh, in 2014 number of requests law enforcement had made to Android and Google, uh, Apple about uh, these sort of, and there were like, a, there were 78 pending cases where uh, Apple and Google had received requests to unlock a device, either from local law enforcement or to the FBI. So this isn't just over, this was one high profile case which went to court, but it's a everyday battle for, in, you know, encryption policy. All right, thank you. There's the bell. Yeah. Oh, is this on? Okay, cool. Uh, I hope this doesn't fall into the category of like, let me Google that for you questions. But um, uh, with respect to like the, uh, the backdoor that you said exists in current phone switches, what does enforcement for that look like? Like, is it like the FCC uh, reviews, like new, like hardware that comes out or like, like so what, are, what are the teeth like? So there's, a, so there's a law called the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. There are two ways to comply with it. One is to have the FBI sign off on your design. The other is to comply with an existing standard called the J standard for historical reasons, which basically says you've got to have this interface and it's got to have this capability and it's got to have something called a call data channel and a call content channel and the you know certain amount of capacity to send uh, traffic back to law enforcement on a T1 line. And if you comply with that, then you, uh, you have a safe harbor and your phone switch is legal and it can be kind of sold to phone companies in the US. So that's the, almost all these switches just comply with the J standard. Um, and, and that's sort of, so they've, they've come out with a standard for doing this. Now the interesting thing is that standard is a standard for being able to deliver content, wiretap content. There's no standard, there's nothing in the standard at all for how that has to be actually secured against unauthorized use. Yeah. Hello. Uh, this this is probably a stupid question, but you only live once, so why not? Um, are the conspiracy theorists right when they say that the only way to keep the government from spying on your smartphone is if you cannot remove the battery to put it into airplane mode and then turn it off? The the conspiracy theorists aren't paranoid enough. <laughs> is the, the short answer. I mean, there's the, if you are being targeted by a government intelligence agency, especially the U.S. NSA, mm -hmm. they probably own every single device that you have if you are a target. If you are a normal person of no consequence, they probably don't, but they could. That, that capability is out there. Um, <coughs> and so I think it's a, it's a matter of distinction, but the technological capabilities of what they are able to do are, are quite vast. And to, to uh, add on to that, um, probably uh, uh, to try to you know, have the balance between uh, what the government's capabilities are and, and, and your, your privacy, you, you, it's going to be very hard to get to a point where you cannot be hacked by a well-determined, well-funded adversary. But you might get to a point where it's really expensive and they can only do those kinds of attacks to people they really care about. Like, and that would mean that for you know, 99 point whatever percent of people uh, that, uh, that they're not going to care that much. Uh, but if they really care about somebody, uh, if, it's, you know, if, if, if your adversary is the NSA, it's Mossad, it's uh, uh, you know, the Chinese and Russian intelligence services, they have capabilities that are, are pretty impressive. But here's the other thing, uh, is that probably going after your, your phone and trying to, to get it through uh, uh, you know, a remote exploit over the air, 
Uh, you know, it's far more efficient just to send you a link and hope that you click on it with, with phishing. Like most of the people who get owned do it because they clicked on a, a phishing link and maybe saw a warning or two and we're like, yeah, but where's my dancing pigs? Uh, and then uh, there's malware installed on, on the phone. So like, if the, like I was going to say, like one of the very hard to do but very important security measures you, you can have is to try to be very aware of, of clicking on links and, and who are they coming from and, and look for uh, signs that they uh, are, are suspicious and, and don't click upon those. Also, it's hard to do on your phone but on your computer. Uh, not operate in admin uh, mode so that if somebody, if, if you did click on the wrong thing, there'll be permissions limited and things like that. Because uh, almost all of the, the attacks that, that happen are through phishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to add to that, that, you know, encryption isn't your only tool to be secure. There, It's, you know, a toolkit, as they say, that um, phishing is one other way. And, uh, you know, it, there are lots of like small things you can do. Look at your privacy settings in your phone. Look at um, a lot of local law enforcement have something called stingrays, which basically uh, act as fake cell towers. And you know, r regardless of encryption or Wi-Fi or the internet, they know who you are and where you are. So if you feel like you're in a location like that, turn your phone off or be on airplane mode. So there are like small things you can do to be secure, but yeah, if somebody wants really if they're well, well funded and well skilled at it, it goes after you. Yeah, but I yeah. think that, you know the overall. I mean, the perspective is really important here, right? I mean, you know, in some sense, it's really, really hard to protect yourself against a government agency targeting you. Um, you know, I don't know how to do it. You know, I'm good at this stuff. I really have no idea um, how I would live my life uh, in in ways that would prevent prevent that. But what I, the game that I think I can win is forcing them to target me in order to be able to compromise my communications. And I think you know that may be ultimately the societal compromise that we mm -hmm. make, which is you know we know that that they're they are going to win, um, where they is any powerful organization, whether it's the U.S. government or 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 Russia or the Chinese government or maybe even organized crime. Uh, you know, that wants to target uh, an individual, you know, we, we can't defend against that. But what we can do is prevent sort of mass scale global surveillance, one stop shopping that, you know, that allows somebody who's malicious at the click of a button to, you know, to get everybody. Um, and, you know, let's make sure that in order, you know, in giving law enforcement what it needs to do its job, that we don't inadvertently also create that one stop shopping. Yeah, and it's not necessarily a bad thing that, you know, if the federal government wants to go after somebody that they can get it. It's the fact that in our society we want checks and balances that, you know, if they are doing that, it's after a court order which is reviewed and not at their whim and fancy. So I think that's also important to the fact that to not make it a global thing, but if they want to do it, yes, they can, but this is how they have to do it. All right, we, I think we have four minutes left, so maybe we have uh, another question or two. So, so I've been in IT a long time, and in, encryption is not just one thing. There's encryption of data at rest, encryption of data in transit, and a whole bunch of other aspects of it. Does it does it help or hinder, or what's the strategy in talking about encryption as one thing versus trying to drill, drill down into the specific aspects of encryption? Uh, I think actually you, you raise a very very uh, very useful point because uh, one of the things actually was happening with the iPhone is that the actual issue was data at rest, and yet that the conversation, uh, a lot of the conversation that was coming about that in, in, in policy circles was also bringing in uh, data in transit and doing you know iMessage and WhatsApp and, and all of that, uh, and so uh, sometimes actually it's very useful to separate out uh, those uh, those issues. Yeah, and you know, let me just add one more point. You know, there's data in transit, data at rest. Um, you know, communications versus stored data. But then there's a third category, which is metadata. And you know, encryption is great at protecting data in transit and great at data at rest. It's not good at all uh, for protecting, you know, in general, the metadata about your communication, when you're communicating, who you're communicating with, and and uh, where you've been, and so on. And you know, that's sort of outside the scope of what encryption can, pr uh, can protect. 
and yet can be extremely revealing uh, about your, you know who you are, what you're doing, what your interests are, and things you'd consider private. Uh, an, an example, I mean, if you if you call the suicide prevention hotline from the Golden Gate Bridge uh, at like three in the morning, do they do they really need to know to listen to your call to have a good idea what you were talking about? Right, they have the location, the metadata often is enough to, to have the, the thrust of the conversation. There's a great study by Stanford CIS um, called Meta, Meta something. Um, if you look at a metadata study by Stanford, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. People volunteered to have their metadata um, examined by researchers, and they lay out six or seven scenarios, including woman calls, sister, talks for two hours, woman calls health clinic, um, women visits health clinic the next day, um, where you know exactly what that person was doing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just like, that is the, the revealing nature. There's also the idea that metadata doesn't lie and content can. Um, so if I'm writing an email to my sister, the government then has to parse through the truth of what I am communicating. The fact that I am writing an email to my sister is just factual, um, and so they don't have to do as much interpretation. All right, last question. Uh, in regards to you know staying on the note of exploitation done by the government uh, for you know the reasons that they have you know for terrorist or whatever, uh, what do you think about Wanna Cry and Eternal Blue? Uh, Wanna Cry, yeah, Wanna Cry was uh, very interesting because it, it was a, you know, uh, turning a revealed exploit that had it been revealed against the, the wishes of the government uh, and turning it into to ransomware. Uh, it had terrible economic uh, uh, effects. I don't think the Wanna Cry authors ended up making a whole lot of money with their, with their ransomware on the Bitcoin side of it. So it was not a particularly profitable enterprise, but it caused a lot of damage. And this was, I think, for a lot of uh, people who have been worried about this, showing the issues with having uh, vulnerabilities that are not being patched uh, because they're useful for investigations. There's always that possibility they'll, they'll get out there. What do you think? Yeah, and let me point out, 2.30 on Monday, yeah. there's a panel um, on, on, on exactly that right here in this very room. So stay tuned. Um, oh. And as a productive way to end the conversation, um, because I don't know if we'll ever get rid of get rid of ransomware. Sorry, um, everybody in here should go home and back up their data. Like, always have a backup copy of your information and encrypt it. Um, <laughs> right. Because of the topic yeah. of this panel, like, there's a lot that governments need to do, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of policy conversation to have about this. But you guys can do a lot for yourselves right. too. Yeah. Um, brush, and there's brush your to teeth on floss, also. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that that uh, brings this panel to to a close. Uh, also, remind you that if you're interested in security, at four o'clock in here, is that right? Uh, there'll be a, a session on how to be more secure, uh, and then tomorrow here at two thirty, we'll have another discussion of encryption. So I encourage you to come to that. And with that, please give a, a round of applause for our wonderful panelists. Thank you, everybody. Come tomorrow and learn why this entire conversation is mute or moot because of what the UK has already done. <laughs> <laughs>